Welcome everyone to the channel. I'm Steven. I'm Brittany. And we are the BS Review. We are here today continuing our Nosferatu series. Today we are doing our second part of the reading vlog. If you guys haven't seen this on the channel before, what we do is we take a book and we read through it and we take you along for the ride with us and we do a check-in. So like we read a little bit and then we sit down and film kind of a discussion of that portion before we move on to the next one. This is part two of a video, so we're going to be starting about halfway through the book. So if you have not seen the first part and are interested, make sure you go back and watch that one first. Also, this is a spoiler-filled video. If you are just wanting to know our thoughts on this spoiler-free, that video will be coming shortly if it is not already up. So just wait for that one. And before we get into our discussion of this check-in, we wanted to remind you guys that we have a giveaway going on. We like to buy two copies of books when we are doing these book reviews. So we have one to give away to you guys. It's going to be the copy that Steven's currently holding. Just as a caveat, this is a used edition that we bought used and we have now read through it ourselves. So it's ever so slightly worn, but it's still in very, very good condition. Most of the wear is on the dust jacket, not the actual book. If you are entering and want more details, let us know. We'll send you specific pictures, etc., etc. But link down in the description for how to enter details of the giveaway, etc. So we ended the last check-in with... Maggie showing up again with Vic and walking off and she left her file of Manx and to just jump right into this story Wayne finds out about Manx he finds the files reads about them and ends up actually asking uh his dad about those same items and Lou kind of walks into that one so Lou at this point doesn't know the fantastical elements of the Manx story and so he confronts Vic about what Wayne found and Vic ends up telling him everything from A to Z except she's still portraying it in a way as if it's like her psyche and her mental issues that cause those memories like she's kind of towing this line between I think they're real but I know they're not real she's in that in-between space and so she's explaining to Lou what's happening but doesn't even fully believe it herself I really like the way she actually tells these stories because she's like I have two stories and they're both real to me. Like, both exist, both are real. One is the official story, and one is, like, my own story in my head. And I, I really like the way that she explains that to Lou. And he seems pretty on board, where he's like, but you know that one's not true, right? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't remember if we mentioned in our last check-in, but I, I think we did. Vic found a motorcycle that she's working on fixing up, and she ends up does fixing it enough to where she can ride it. So she kind of takes off. I think it's in the middle of Wayne, like, grilling her about Manx and what's going mm -hmm. on. And she's just like, hold up, I gotta ride this motorcycle. And so she does, and she ends up seeing the Shorter Way Bridge in the process. So it's pretty clear at this point that the motorcycle is her new knife into her pocket split reality thing majig and uh so she sees the shorter way bridge starts to go over it but like freaks out and basically like aborts mission yeah because she's like i'm going crazy i'm gonna lose my son i can't do this and so she stops i find it really interesting though that the bike wouldn't start until she said let's go find and uh -huh. then it like just kicks on so there is some like a magical quality to this i think it's wholeheartedly tied to her belief and mm -hmm. her mindset because the bridge started to kind of like fall apart the bike started to fall apart when she started to rationalize what was happening and saying this is just my brain this is not actually happening and when she was doing that like the situation around her that is this mystical magical thing started to crumble and so unfortunately while Vic is out riding her bike and you know she she stops so suddenly she breaks the bike so she's having to walk the motorcycle all the way back and while she's doing that, she's far away. Manx and Bing roll up in their car and they kidnap Wayne. So Wayne is in the process of being kidnapped and Vic actually comes up upon the scene while this is happening. But Wayne's already in the car. He's already kind of stuck there. And there's some crazy things happening. But Vic kind of gets into this fight with Manx and Bing ends up shooting Manx in the process and Vic ends up getting like severely hurt which I was very stressed out during the scene because I did not remember it for those of you if you skipped the first part of this reading <laughs> log we've read this book before this is our second read through and I completely forgot about this part and so she's sitting there and Manx is going to town on her with like a hammer and you're hearing things 
break and you're like okay well she's dead because like at one <laughs> yeah. point like her spine is going and I'm like what mystical magical things is gonna get her out of this one because I know she like survives past this but I, how and it turns out that her motorcycle jacket that she was wearing had the reinforced plates in it um for motorcycle accidents and that's what ended up saving her life I just think there's such an interesting quality to these scenes and how Joe Hill writes them they feel so claustrophobic so this whole scene is happening, like, in an open field. He tries to hit her with the car and goes through a fence. And so they're just, like, in a yard. And even though that it's happening in this wide open space, it feels so, like, very similar to the action scene when she earlier in the book where she's trapped in the pantry mm -hmm. and just trying to hold the pantry door closed. You're just like, Ugh, there's no escaping, and she is trapped, and it's so stressful. But she does end up getting away, and I really like how she bides her time with her big old wrench and when the time is right turns around and hits him right in the head with it. So we learned during this fight scene that Manx is not indestructible. He can definitely be injured. He can definitely be hurt. However, he still gets away and still lives. So at this point, he's pretty much gone off with Wayne. Wayne is gone. Vic couldn't save him. She couldn't get to him before they drove off. And so at that point, she calls the police and brings them in. So in the minutes that follow, um, Vic has called the police. They have everyone set up in her house, and she is waiting for the guy. I really like how she how she says the this guy. in her head. Yeah, she's like she's like, I look around and I haven't seen the guy, the one you know's in charge, and is going to find my. You know my what this kid. reminded me of is Spy Kids three. <laughs> have you seen that movie where they're waiting for the guy who like saves everything and is mm -hmm. like ends up being uh, Elijah Wood, but um. Yeah, I really liked how she portrayed that, and then it ends up being a woman. Which is also the best, is the woman just walks up behind her in the kitchen one morning, and then she's like, that's the guy. And while this is happening, Lou gets a call from Wayne while he's in the airport, about to hop on his plane. And this is such a sad scene, and so stressful, because, like, Wayne calls him, he's like, I'm being kidnapped, don't call me back, we'll find out, hangs up the phone. And Lou essentially has, like, a heart attack. He totally has a yeah. heart attack. Or some sort of cardiac event, whatever yeah. you want to call it. And then it just like cuts scenes and you're like, did Lou die? Is he <laughs> yeah. okay? What happened? <sighs> and you shift back to Vic's house and a, a little time passes and Lou ends up walking in. He looks a little pale and he looks a little downtrodden, but he's there. He's present. He's not in the hospital dying. So that's good. Um... And at that point, they're kind of bonding and Vic's trying to explain that this was Manx and the detective, the guy, person who ends up not being really a detective, is trying to tell her, hey, Manx is dead, blah, blah. And Vic's like, did you find a body? And the, the people are just like, what? No, but he's 85 and old and was in a coma and people... And he died. Normal humans, yeah. Like, even if for some reason he didn't die... Like, that's not possible because he was in a coma. 85-year-olds in comas cannot recover quick enough for that. He had his chest open and his heart removed during an autopsy. Like, there's no way they're trying to rationalize with her. And Vic's just, like, out of her mind at this point, understandably. And so you have these details that don't quite add, add up. Because things that Vic says that she has no knowledge of, like naming the type of hammer it is and stuff that pop up, those things, like, aren't supposed to line up, but they do. And so... Hutter starts being, like, the FBI agent, like, kind of confused, but interested, and I think at this point, Lou starts to fully back Vic, because Vic pulls him aside and was like, I know what is going on, I saw my bridge, I can, like, I'm the only one who can find him, and he's like, okay. So it almost seems like the FBI is operating under the assumption that Lou somehow was involved, or Vic was involved, and there's some grand conspiracy happening, but we don't know quite what's going through their heads at this point, we don't get a full insight into that, but you can tell that they're very suspicious, and Vic even calls them out on that at some point. Well... It's especially hard because you can tell that they're starting to railroad her. She has a history of mental instability, schizophrenia, psychosis. So they start to be like, the dead guy showing up and kidnapping your child isn't as likely as you going crazy in a psychotic event, murdering your kid, and then coming up with a delusion. 
convince yourself yeah it, it almost seems because they're she's like well i have bruises on my back how do you explain that and they're like well yeah we have no doubt that someone attacked you and it's almost like they're implying wayne fought back yeah which was an interesting dynamic i love how much is left out of these scenes i love how much is left up to your imagination and your conclusions joe hill does a really good job i think stephen king does as well to a certain extent but i really particularly enjoy how joe hill write scenes in a way where it gives you just enough information but it doesn't spend the time to overly explain. Yeah, it always feels very calculated in Joe Hill novels, I find, that he always gives you just enough and you can tell that he was like, that's fine and that's it. I think some of the cooler moments in this section were especially the call-outs to his father's body of work and Stephen King novels and kind of implies that this is set in the same universe as... I don't think it implies. I think it's... Well, yeah, I mean, it straight up says, like, oh, some of those other books in the Stephen King universe, this is set in that same universe. So the first reference we come across that I remember is the Shawshank reference. And at some point they mention, like, oh, well, somebody's locked up in Shawshank or mm -hmm. should have been locked up in... I think Manx was going to be sent to... I don't yeah. remember. Is that what it was? Uh, I don't some, know. They somehow bring up Shawshank when the detectives are talking, and I'm like over there and then later we have um this explanation of this map so they do this find my iphone feature to try to find wayne because he still has a cell phone on him and it ends up pulling this map that looks distorted of the u.s yeah it's weird and it's called the united states of inscapes or something like that oh, i forgot about that yeah and so it literally uses the word inscapes and there's all these weird things and on it it actually has up in Derry, maine it says Pennywise's Circus, and you're like, ooh. So I, I want to pull up the quote uh, that talked about the Inscape because I really like how it's explained. So after they come up with this map on the iPhone, Lou and Vic are talking about it later privately, and Vic's trying to explain to Lou her theories on what this Inscape is, and I really like how it's explained. Um, it says that... It's kind of, it is our world, a version of it anyway. The version of it that Charlie Manx carries around in his head. Everyone lives in two worlds, right? There's the physical world, but there's also our own private inner worlds, the world of our thoughts. A world made of ideas instead of stuff. It's just as real as our world, but it's inside. It's an inscape. And it's taught, it goes on to talk about how all of our inscapes are connected. If a musician writes a song and you hear that song, you get a little piece of their inscape because it came out of their head. And I think that as an author, that's such a cool thing to put into a book because you know that's what's going on in authors' heads. They have all these worlds in their heads and they have all these stories that they're trying to connect and get out. And I think it also uh, has more implications of it connecting back to Stephen King's stories as well. Mm -hmm. It's pulling in those inscapes. I just think it has a lot of connotations to it and I find it fascinating. Yeah, I really like that because in and of itself, you're reading this book and it's almost like Joe Hill saying, this is me giving you a piece of my Here's mind my right here. Yeah. yeah. As well, there was some fun little references in there when she's first starting to try the bike and it first starts up right before she rides off. She says, hi -oh, Silver, away, and then blasts off. And I just thought that was a really funny call out to it as well. I'm sure there's some, in, some references that we've missed in there. We haven't read all of Stephen King's body of work, so we caught the bigger ones. I remember the first time we went through this. What year was it? Was it like 20? Was it before we got married? Yeah. I guess so it must have been like 2014. I don't remember. It was a while ago. And I only picked up the Pennywise reference because I knew who Pennywise mm -hmm. was at that point, even though I had, had no familiarity with the body of work that Pennywise comes from. But I didn't pick up Shaw on Shawshank because I had never read Shawshank. I had never seen the movie. Still haven't seen the movie. Um, I didn't pick up on the Hi-Ho Silver because we hadn't watched it at that point or read it or any of those things. So um, it was it's kind of fun now going back to it and revisiting it, picking up on these uh, little tendrils of Stephen King things. I honestly want Joe Hill to follow up with more books like in this universe with this idea of inscapes and stuff because there's so many interesting ones and Manx even calls out a couple times where he's like, oh, I've been to Orphan Henge, whatever the heck that is. There's other places yeah, on the map. Yeah, the treehouse of something, you know, because all we see is the graveyard of what might be, which is in a separate location, the Christmas yes. land, which I, when we first read about it earlier in the book, I thought that those were like right next to each Same. other, but like... That one's, like, way over here, like, in, like, Kentucky, and then Christmas Land's, like, way out west. So, I think there's a lot of room to explore more. I wonder if he... Ha Joe Hill has a short story collection coming out, I believe it's later this year, and I wonder if some of those may have some of that. Maybe so. I know they do reference Lock and Key, because there's... Uh, Which... One of the locations was... 
We're probably going to do a series around Lock and Key in the future because it's becoming a TV show. I don't know if all the things are solidified yet. I think it's still in that realm of it's been optioned, but we don't know if it's happening. But if it does, we'll read it. We have the first volume. We bought it. It's on a shelf over here somewhere. One other interesting thing that we learned during this little 120 pages that we read is that Manx has a little bit more to his knife than Vic does. So his car can have healing properties to him. He starts to heal from the cut and the, the wound on his face that Vic caused. And also we learn that his backseat of his car acts as a pocket universe. And so Wayne keeps trying to like crawl to the front seat and stuff like that. And he explained to Lou on the phone when he called him, he's like, I keep trying to crawl to the front see it and I keep ending up in the backseat like it's this loop. I'm so interested to see how they do that on the TV show. But uh, so there's a lot more like this inscapes and pocket universes and it's just it makes my sci-fi brain happy. And so ultimately this section ends with with Vic gearing up to chase after them and find them. Lou agrees to help fix the bike and at the same time, Manx with Wayne and Bing show up at Bing's house, the house of sleep. And we also notice that Wayne is starting to transition. He's starting to have trouble and noticing himself sometimes just being happy that he's there with him or being excited for Christmas land and then like bouncing back and trying to be like, no, this isn't right. And so he is starting to undergo a shift and we assume it's into one of the creepy hook faced children that inhabit Christmas land. So we'll see what happens with that. So with that, we are going to end this check-in. We've got two more left in this video, about 150-ish pages, 250-ish pages left. So we're going to read the next 120 pages and we'll see you guys in just one second. All right, we are back with check-in number four and this is the penultimate check-in. We are getting close to the finale of the book and a lot happened in this one. So we're continuing Wayne's storyline being kidnapped by Manx. They're currently on their way to the sleigh house and getting to know more about Manx and about uh, what effects Wayne is having along the way. Yeah, he's definitely starting to transition and we see him like drifting out of thought almost and starting to accept his position and his journey to Christmas land, which is very spooks. And while that's going on, we have Vic back at the house with all of the detectives. They're still trying to find Wayne, figure out if Vic was involved, all that jazz. And Lou has been working on the motorcycle and he finally gets it working. So Vic decides to split and leave the house and get past all of the cops and everything to get out. It was a very intense scene. Yeah, it was clear that they decided that they were going to take her in as an official suspect at this point. And so she rolls out, and it wasn't completely fixed because the brakes do not work on this motorcycle. <laughs> so she just has to keep going and very slowly slow down if she needs to stop. But her power does activate, and she goes on the hunt, and she goes to the House of Sleep where um, I think Minx told her they were going. So at the end of our last check-in, I think we had just left the House of Sleep, Um and then they were on their way to the mm -hmm. sleigh house because those are two different things. Yep. Um, so Vic goes to the sleigh house or try, is it the sleigh house or the house of sleep? That she house goes? of sleep. She, she goes, goes to the house of sleep. Yeah. So she uh, takes the shorter way bridge, goes to the house of sleep and Bing ends up grabbing her in the process. Yeah. Be since Manx left Bing behind, this is Bing's desperate attempt to get back into his good graces. And so... He gasses her and takes her to his creepy basement. Which we found out in last check-in what he does in said basement. That's real creepy. And of course, Vic is not into that. I mean, none of them are into it. But uh, he ends up knocking her out for a little while. And when she comes to, she's actually able to... Uh, I forget like what all details happen, but she essentially like sets off like a gas explosion. Well, the gas that he uses to gas the people he keeps down there is very flammable and she sees that. And so you get this awesome scene oh, so cool. where Bing is there about to rape her and then she's like, I'm just going to blow us both up if that's what it comes to. And so she pulls it out fully straight. She's going to blow up too and lights that sucker and... So the canister for the gas is, like, in Bing's, like, he's, like, holding it in a way to where it's, like, pressed up against his midsection, and it ends up, like, cutting him in half, so his body is just spread out across the entire basement. He's splattered across the wall. It's awesome. For such a gross character, mm -hmm. 
it was a great ending, I think, for And him. it actually knocks Vic out, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. And so she comes to with, like, guts hanging from the ceiling and whatnot. <laughs> and it's been 24 hours at yeah. this point, too. She was out for, like, a day. Yeah. So she calls uh, the detective and tells them where she's at and that they need to come check it out. And she also finds the dead body of some guy. The guy who was in the the wraith when it activated to go get Manx, um, which I don't know if we mentioned that, but there was a guy in it and Bing ended up killing him in the basement and he put a note saying what happened to him in his mouth before he died. Yeah, so. he was able to write a note before being killed him. So she contacts the cops, tells them to come there. There's also a body that they need to take care of and contact that guy's daughter because that was mentioned in the note. And she rolls out because she doesn't want to get caught by the cops again, but she's, like, watching from, like, afar. But there is one of my favorite parts before she rolls out that happens, though, is that she gets on on the phone with Manx and... She's, like, talking to him, and he's like, oh, where's Bing? And she's, like, splattered across the fucking wall. And I'm like, <laughs> badass. I think Vic is, like, the quintessential, like, badass woman character who doesn't take shit, and she is on the hunt, and I love it. And to finish out this section, we end up getting a little bit more information about Manx and his backstory. So you find out that he had a bad relationship with his wife, who basically, his backstory is, like, so silly to me, just because... <sighs> His wife nags him and is mean to him, and so this is the way he becomes an evil, super immortal vampire. So we have to remember that Manx is very, very old. We d- um, he mentions at one point that he's old enough to where his first date with his wife uh, was to a silent film. So he's that old. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think some gender roles come into play and the time period come into play with that. But he's definitely one of those dudes who expect their wives to do everything for them and they can just be deadbeats. And his wife wasn't necessarily doing that. And of course she was unhappy because it wasn't an equal marriage. And so he's just a big baby about it. So he decides to be use his ability... To, he takes his two daughters to Christmas Land and turns them into the little Christmas creatures mm-hmm. and kills his wife. Yes. And this is actually how he got the Wraith. He was, like, using it and restoring it for, I think, like, chauffeuring and stuff. So mm-hmm. that's where the Wraith came from, and that's kind of when he found out about his powers and started using them. So that's everything that happened in this last 120 pages. We're on page about 540 at this point. We have like 680 total. So we got about another 140 to go. That will be our last check-in. And I'm very excited for the climax and to share it with you guys. So we're going to finish up this book and we will see you guys at our last check-in. Welcome everyone. It is the final check-in of our reading vlog part two. And we're just going to jump right into it. So this section carries off everything's moving at a very quick pace at this point and this section picks up right when Lou has a heart attack like for real and he goes down gets taken to the hospital and you have a fun little scene with a guy who identifies as a brown coat a firefly fan and Lou actually ends up escaping the hospital and goes who knows where for now And the hospital escape isn't necessarily an escape. It's kind of orchestrated because they want Lou to lead them to Vic. So they kind of set it up to where he thinks he's escaping, but they really, like, made it so he could do that. And at the same time that that is happening, Vic is over visiting Maggie again. So she has gone back to the library that Maggie used to work at. And it is now a very run-down library. Not even run-down. It's just abandoned. It's derelict. It's home to druggies and whatnot, which Maggie is one of, and she's just living in this space and trying to keep up this place that was her home back in the day, and she has such a strong emotional connection to it that she's just trying to keep it hers, essentially. And in the process of this, uh, she's talking to Vic about how she's going to kill Manx and how she's going to destroy him, and she tells Vic that she has to destroy the Wraith in order to truly destroy Charlie Manx. And I just think this whole scene, this whole section, is just so heartbreaking. Because you just really see how these fantastic powers that they got end up just destroying these people. And so both Vic and Maggie at this point are pretty much wrecked, you know, by their own powers. Simultaneously giving them the ability to do cool things, but also kind of taking something away from them at the same time. And Maggie can, like, barely talk at this point. 
and Vic is struggling too, and it's just really sad. And then it gets sadder because while Vic is asleep, Maggie goes outside because she sees, oh, actually, Wayne runs through the library. Manx and Wayne arrive at this library because Manx decided to make a stop because he was tired of Maggie. And so they have a little confrontation where he kills Maggie. And I forgot about this death from the first time Me we read too. this. So I was shocked rereading this. I was like, oh, no, I forgot it's about this. It's super brutal. He ends up killing her with that mallet hammer thing that uh, Hutter is trying to figure out um, where it came from and all that stuff from way earlier in the book. And it's just described in such excruciating detail and how she just like rag dolls across the pavement. And it's just, oh, it was so heartbreaking. So by the time Vic wakes up and finds Maggie, Manx is gone and the cops are showing up. And so... She basically splits. She heads off to her dad's house, which was her next destination, um, to get some explosions that explosives that he has access to. So she just takes off over there. And it turns out that the department, the police department, has rigged this whole area as like listening to and they're keeping track of her dad because they think she'll come there at some point, and they're correct. And uh, she kind of sneaks in through the back to talk to Lou and dad because Lou is now at her dad's house. And there's actually a cool moment where when she summons her bridge in and pops in, it actually kills all the electronics. So all their listening devices and video feeds and everything like die when she pops in. And so they go to investigate in person. The FBI people are going through the woods to sneak up on them to sneak around the back. So they have a nice little reunion. I thought it was nice how Vic and her father got to like reconnect briefly there and recognize that they both are just good at blowing things up, including their families. And I thought that was kind of a cool scene. And then it turns into a sad scene because Vic's dad ends up sacrificing himself to distract the FBI so she can get away on her bridge and Lou goes with her. I forgot about this death too. I forgot, I forgot about all the Yeah, deaths. I forgot about all of them. So, so when... The dad totally gets shot three times, you know, blocking the cops from shooting Vic. You're just like, oh. So Vic's really going through the ringer. This book is just putting her through the meat grinder. And Lou ends up getting on the bike and saying, I'm coming with you. And they both ride over the bridge. So Lou actually gets to go over the bridge for the first time. But Vic was right in that having Lou on there did make it tougher. And they ended up hitting the wall and some of the bats flew out, which is like her mental faculties. And they end up making it through and they arrive back at the sleigh house, the entrance to Christmas land before Manx actually arrives. And they arrive there in the forest. And then Vic actually handcuffs Lou to a tree. And they have such a sweet moment beforehand because, you know, they're both trying to rescue their kid. They've gone through so much life together. Lou has always kind of known about Manx, but never really, like, understood the gravity of it or how real the situation was. So he's really drawn into this at this point. And they just have, like, this such sweet bonding moment that's just, like, the trend of everything that's happening. Don't worry, Lou doesn't die. But he does get handcuffed cuffed to a tree and left because she's like you can't do this with me I have to do it by myself which really just solidifies that she understands that she doesn't have too much gas left in her tank at this point Literally she's and figuratively. yeah she's been hit by cars she's been beat down she's got blown up she's she's had a tough time <laughs> and so I don't think it's clear that she doesn't plan on coming back at this point except for getting Wayne back and it's really sad to see her go off and, but Lou kind of understands at the same time, even though he's mad. And so Manx finally arrives, opens the door, the tunnel to Christmas land, and Vic follows them through. And you get some really cool, creepy descriptions of Christmas land here. Because I feel like throughout the earlier parts of the book, there's creepy parts of Christmas land, but everyone's talking about it. You don't always get to, like, see Christmas land. And I think one of the cooler things about Christmas land is there's this big, spooky moon. I feel like it's... I have no idea how they're going to do this in the show because it's, like, goofy but terrifying. It reminds me, the way they describe it, of, which you may not get this reference, in Legend of Zelda game Majora's Mask, there's a gigantic moon with a face hurtling towards the earth that gets closer and closer. And it's very creepy looking and... Maybe it will toss up an image if it's not too much work. Oh, somewhere. see, I was leaning more towards Teletubby's baby son. 
<laughs> but creepy. creepy. <laughs> but creepier. It's already yes. kind of creepy. Yes. We'll, we'll throw up images yeah. for those of you who may not understand what we're Maybe talking so. About. But the moon, like, talks and, like, breathes. Like, the wind that aggressive. blows. Yeah. And Very especially aggressive. as soon as it notices Vic, like, mm-hmm. screams. And you see, like, creepy kids in the woods and dead bodies and... So there, Vic ends up going to this kind of like main street that she's driving down that has like different shops that are Christmassy themed and whatnot. And uh, you see kids coming out of the alleyways in between these stores and, you know, kids, but they're really like vampires at this point or whatever Charlie turns them into. And also um, a scene that I completely forgot about and is just like horrific was this huge uh roller coaster and on the roller coaster there are adult dead bodies just like hung up and tortured and just the descriptions like there's a lot of gruesome stuff in this book but it is like to the nth degree in this finale like it is just like i was doing that the whole time i was reading this whole section it's gory and gruesome there's a gigantic christmas tree in the middle of christmas land But instead of ornaments, they have heads Mm -hmm. of, like, the parents that they've killed. Like, there's so much gruesome stuff here. And you actually end up having this big showdown showdown, because Vic rides in and there's a whole crowd of all the kids have gathered by the Christmas tree. Manx is there and Wayne is there, who is pretty... Almost fully transformed. Yeah, almost fully transformed at this point. And Manx, like, sicks all the kids on her. And she starts riding and you get these... This, I feel like, very, like, visual scene of these really creepy kids, like, climbing on the bike and stuff, trying to stab her. And she does get stabbed once before she jets off, and she starts throwing explosives. She ends up blowing everything up. She blows up the roller coaster we talked about. She blows up the big Christmas tree. And then she ends up putting the rest of her info by the mountains and causing a huge avalanche to actually bury the rest of Christmas land. All the while, the kids are attacking her. She gets stabbed slash bit several times. So she's like, like one of the kids like bites her shoulder and takes a chunk out. She gets like stabbed in the side. So like, and there's even a part of the book where Vic's like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to die from that one. Like when she gets stabbed, she's like, I'm donezo. Um, But she blows up Christmas land, ruins it. The moon's freaking out like, kill her. And... I don't know what to say. She ends up grabbing Wayne after the big explosion, the avalanche, and summons her bridge and jets back off with Manx right behind her, screaming bloody murder. So as Manx and Vic are going through this bridge, Wayne points out that the bats are starting to like swarm and there's this whole parallel with Bruce Wayne and the bats and this has kind of been an ongoing theme throughout the book and uh, they end up kind of attacking Mace's car. At first, it seems kind of accidental that they're just in the way, but then it seems a little more intentional. And the Wraith ends up falling through the floor of the bridge because the bridge is starting to fall apart at this point. It is very much connected to Vic. Vic is falling apart. Bridge is falling apart. It all goes together. And the Wraith falls through the floor and is gone. And Vic is trying to get out of this bridge before it completely collapses and takes her too. And she does. She ends up getting out. She's watching the bats swarm everywhere because they're all gone from the bridge now. Again, a metaphor for her mental state and physical well-being. And she ends up coming to a stop with Wayne. And the last, like, little thing we have in this section is Wayne saying, oh, well, what's wrong, Mama? And she says, we're out of gas. And then the chapter ends. So after the chapter ends, kind of a fade to black moment, you flip the page and we fast forwarded, what is it, six months? Yeah. Six months. And you're like, oh, Okay, what happened? And, man, Vic died. Yeah, shouldn't make it. Which I was very shocked by the first time we read this through, because I really wasn't ready. I feel like this is such a Vic-centric book that for almost this entire novel, it's the full lifetime of this character. And while it's not the longest book and it's very fast-paced, I feel like you end up getting so many scenes of Vic's life, you're just like man, we've really done the whole thing with this character. And then she's gone. So she died afterwards, and we pick up with Lou and Wayne back at the house. With this flash forward, we're finding out where Wayne's at, but especially where Lou is at. He has recovered from his heart attack, it seems like, for the most part. He's actually now dating the FBI agent, Hutter, which I was not expecting and I forgot about. And 
it kind of oddly fits because she gets what he went through and she it's very clear at this point that she has pretty much come to terms with what happened was real to a certain degree i'm not sure if she fully understands it but there's some level of believability there for her so she's able to support wayne and lou in their recovery of this event so i think one of the more interesting aspects of this final chapter is that wayne looks normal now but there are some lasting mental effects from his transformation he ends up turning all the way back but you have some really creepy scenes where he like touches his teeth and remembers there being like hooks there and sometimes has intrusive thoughts where he's like wow i'd love to eat them or like see what their head looks like on a spike and or he like, sees news stories about yeah. people dying or whatever and he like giggles yeah and so there's clearly something wrong and not only that, but he's getting calls from the kid, just like the kids from Christmas Land, just like Mom did, even though Christmas Land is now gone. And so you have this fun scene where Lou one morning is just like, Wayne, we're going, we're going on a trip. Because he runs a tow truck business. He's like, we're, we're going to go in the truck. And Hutter's like, I'll come too. And so they all hop in this truck. And you find out that Lou is actually aware of these changes with Wayne, that he didn't come back quite the same. So he ends up taking Wayne all the way back to the sleigh house because they're trying to get him to connect with what happened to him and move past it and something like that. And at the sleigh house, there's these trees, just, you know, trees around the property, but they all have Christmas ornaments in them. And this is one of the things that makes the sleigh house, like, very Christmassy themed and whatnot. It's something we mentioned before. And Hutter actually has this idea to smash the ornaments. I believe when Vic came back, at one point she says to Lou, the ornament. Oh, did she? I think so. Hmm. A lot happens in this book, guys. So I think that there is something with the ornament. There's something that, that clues them into maybe possibly doing that. And so they decide to smash the ornaments and start smashing them. And they eventually find the one that belonged to Wayne because Manx gave Wayne an ornament the when moon. he captured him, the moon. And when they smash it, Wayne feels like he goes back to normal. And they end up smashing all of them. And not only that, but as they're smashing them, the kids start to come out from the forest. Mm -hmm. And Hutter sees them and she kind of starts talking to them. And you're kind of left with the feeling that she takes care of them or figures out places for them and she kind of takes ownership of figuring out what to do with them but it's this really interesting scene where they all come out of the trees just showing up I guess they've all just been living around there it's it's kind of unclear if they were just in the area like living by themselves it's kind of unrealistic that six months they would have been or is it that they manifested after the ornaments I think it's matched? I think it's, it's that a little they ambiguous I think it's that they manifested because I think the idea was they were all still trapped in Christmas mm -hmm. land Wayne got out but they were all still trapped right. there after the fact and with no way out especially after Manx being dead so I think once they smashed it they just kind of brought them back because you have kids from like the 19, early 1900s like walking mm -hmm. out of the woods and stuff it's pretty crazy and that is actually where we end up leaving the story now something that's interesting about this book that i was not aware of because it is not in our copies is there's an alternate ending apparently i had a, a co-worker who read this book on audiobook and his audiobook version had this alternate ending where manx's two daughters after you know they saved the kids and all this manx's two daughters come out and they're still holding their ornaments so they're still like vampired and whatnot so there's kind of this like tease of something happening i'm kind of glad that's not the actual ending i prefer the actual ending i don't like this whole like oh there could be a sequel thing because this is fine as a standalone we do not need another one so now that we've made it all the way through this book for a second time i mean i think this book is just so excellent i especially think this being the final check-in it's so nice to read a story like this that has a very good like start middle and ending you know not to compare him to his father, he's not his father, but Stephen King sometimes struggles with the third act, and it's pretty even cool. Even the second act. <laughs> even the second act. So I think it's cool to see Joe Hill come through with this story that really follows through on everything that I think it brought up, especially at the beginning. And I don't know, it's really, it's a really cool book to read. It's still one of my absolute favorites. I recommend it to anybody who enjoys horror in any capacity. I think that if you don't enjoy horror, this isn't the book for you. But if you do, 
I hope you've already read it if you've sat through this entire video, but if you haven't, even knowing all these things, I do recommend reading it because Joe Hill's writing style is just so immersive and so fun to read. It's a great reading experience. And like we said before, we do highly recommend the audiobook of this as well. And before we go, remember to join our giveaway. We are giving away a nice hardcover version of this. It is US only. Sorry guys, costs a little too much to ship a book overseas, but you can win this. It's awesome. Great hardcover book. You guys can enter down in the description below. If you liked this video and enjoy our reading vlogs, please give it a big thumbs up. It really encourages us to keep doing these types of videos if that's what you guys want to see. And please subscribe if you're interested to see not only more videos from us, but specifically videos in the series. We do have a few more videos planned for once the show is complete, as well as a spoiler-free book review, which if you've watched through this whole video, you probably aren't interested in. But uh, thank you for joining us. We had a great time, and we'll see you in our next video. Bye.